Okay, you're all set. Okay, great. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody to General Government A uh, agency presentation. And today we will be starting out at one o'clock with uh, Secretary of State at 1.30, State Contracting Standards Board, and at two o'clock, the Office of the Advocate. And I hope everybody is warm and just enjoying the day. So let's get started. Madam Secretary, go right ahead. Good afternoon, Representative Walker, members of the committee. I can't see everyone on my screen at once, so I won't uh, recognize someone who's not there. But I do see about six members of my team joining me. Um, and I know time is precious, so I will turn it back to the committee. And we are all here, happy and available to answer any questions you may have. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to acknowledge the Representative Ryan, who is the House Chair, and I don't see the Senate Chair here, but that's okay. We can keep on going. Representative Ryan, do you have anything you'd like to say? To uh, yeah, unfortunately, I did not was not aware we wouldn't be at the Capitol today, so my notes are sitting on my desk in Hartford rather than with me here, though I have a copy of the budget. Um, I, I think one of the considerations, I know Senator Austin has suggested a couple of questions, is I think one of the considerations we had is um, looking at the governor's budget and knowing how uh, this is the first year for early voting. Um, if you were looking for funding to um, publicize early voting, uh, if there's anything that you want to make remarks of in that regard. Absolutely. Thank you, Representative. Um, we definitely feel the governor's budget falls a little short in a few areas. Um, if you don't have it in front of you, you'll see that we submitted written testimony asking for approximately $9 million for fiscal 2025. Um, as you mentioned, public education was missing from the governor's budget during um, uh, 2020, during the pandemic, and in the legislative session following, we our office had received a $2 million, million dollar appropriation just for general education around elections. And we found during that time that some of the common mistakes that typically happen, like people filling out their absentee ballot uh, envelope incorrectly, that uh, those numbers went way down. Um, so we have found that and we were doing television, radio, gas stations, internet, and we found that it really um, was of service to the general population. We had also, so we had asked for that and that was denied in uh, this past, in the biennium budget that passed last session. Um, we had also asked separate from that, for an allocation to educate 100% purely around early voting. Um, as all of you who have read the bill probably know, it is quite confusing to the general public. I've been doing speaking engagements around early voting starting in November, and people are very confused because it's a different number of days for each type of election. There are different times of day for different elections on different days of the week. People are very confused about the differences between different elections um, and whether or not they can register and vote on the same day. Um, and we just feel that having some public education dollars to help smooth um, this over at a time when elections are um, under greater scrutiny than ever before, especially in a presidential election year, we think that would be um, uh, we, we think the state needs to help uh, smooth the path for individuals. We also had requested um, about 500,000 in expenses that are ongoing. They've been going up for a number of years, but we've always, um, for the last 
four years been able to dip into HAVA money and ARPA money to cover those costs. But in the next fiscal year, we don't have those resources to dip into. And those are election related expenses, uh, things that we have to do. Um, I listed some examples in my testimony, but you know, it's the boring mundane things like software licensing, but we need to pay those costs to make sure that our businesses can register and that our centralized voter registration system is functioning. Um, as you know, we print the blue books. We have been trying to reduce the number that are printed since it is now available online. But statutorily, we are required to print um, some of these books. We have the um, ERIC system, which is uh, uh, a system by which multiple states around the country are able to exchange data confidentially and restrict double voting from happening across state lines. Um, and, and, and then some other uh, uh, expenses such as that. We also requested one million uh, for risk limiting audits. Those of you who have served for a number of years may recall that um, there was a study bill passed um, and the results of that bill came back uh, in the 2021 session, I believe it was, or 2022, uh, recommending that Connecticut adopt risk limiting audits, which are seen as the way audits should be done. Um, as you know, we have a simple audit system where we pick some towns at random, um, conduct an audit, but that basically just ensures that the tapes are read correctly. Um, Homeland Security and other federal agencies are recommending that uh, organizations move toward risk limiting audits, which um, provide a statistical certainty that the results we are seeing are actually correct. I won't get into all the boring details, um, but that is something uh, that Connecticut, the Elections Committee thought should be adopted. We just didn't receive an appropriation uh, to make that happen. Um, but once again, as elections are coming under greater and greater scrutiny, it feels like a move. This is the time um, when Connecticut should adopt that. And last but certainly not least, we've requested $5 million that would go through us as a pass through, but directly to the towns to cover the cost of early voting. And one thing I want to make clear, I believe the actual cost to the towns is quite a lot higher than 5 million. I think the real cost is going to be closer to eight or 9 million. Um, I do recognize the importance of uh, everyone having a little bit of skin in the game. Um, but I think the 5 million will allow for every town to implement early voting uniformly um, and making sure uh, they have the poll workers they need, the equipment they need for ballot security and chain of custody, um, and uh, uh, the training that they need. And sorry, Representative, I think I went beyond the scope of your question, <laughs> but... No, I think you probably answered a lot of other questions. Going to the amount of money that's going to be allocated to towns, and yet now you're saying that you could probably actually use more money. I know I listened to my registrar voters the other day um, who gave her version of how this is going to be implemented, and I'll put it that way and not say anything else. How did you come up with the figures? Did you ask the individual towns how much they thought it was going to cost them to implement Um Early voting. I know uh, the registrar the other day talked about how the rules were constantly changing, so it was difficult for them to think about what they're going to have to implement uh, for any of the elections, the primaries or the general election. Uh, but how did you give any consideration to their input into what it would cost to be able to implement early voting, both at the primaries and local elections, as well as the uh, presidential elections? Thank you. Excellent question. When we were, all of us, <laughs> trying to draft the early voting legislation last year, there were a lot of unknowns. Um, 
after session ended, our office put together a survey that we sent to the registrars. It was optional. Uh, and it asked them a uh, myriad of questions from how many staff people do you think you'll need um, to uh, how much training do those staff people need? What are you thinking about ballot security measures? Will you need additional equipment? Do you anticipate having more than one location as the statute allows for? If so, do you have a secure uh, connection to the centralized voter registration system? Um, I, I believe we had about 50 questions <laughs> all in. 123 towns responded. Um, so that does give us a good baseline Um uh, I know OFA has also worked very hard at looking at some of that data and trying to come up with an estimate. Um, there are a few things that I did not ask about that have since become known. Um, and when the survey went out, the towns didn't yet know what the staffing requirements would be in accordance with the bill. Again, without getting into a lot of the detail, uh, one such example is the statute calls for one moderator to staff the early voting location. And that was a nod to small towns so that they didn't have to have all of the positions that you would typically see on election day. However, to make sure that any location where voting is happening um, uh, in accordance with legislation outside of the early voting bill, curbside voting has to be done by someone representing each party. So already that brings the minimum to three people. So that in and of itself is a huge cost difference if you're required to have one person versus three. Um, I don't think the legislature intended this and will be coming back with a fix um, a proposed fix, but by using the word moderator, um, there are statutory obligations that a moderator has to follow that, again, I don't think it was the legislative intent, but what it means is that no registrar or voter can staff early voting. <laughs> um, so that in and of itself, again, calls for some additional costs because I know many towns intended for their registrar to staff the day. Um, so we, so looking at legislation that exists outside of the early voting statute, um, I think we'll be fine for the presidential preference primary with some of those differences. But once you get into the fall um, once you look at the amount of training that has to happen, um, no one has factored in actual cost of the registrar's training. Um, as you know, statutorily, they have to complete um, a certificate, so they will all need to complete the uh, new early voting training. Uh, because early voting is different than election day voting, all of their poll workers need additional training. Uh, many people don't realize poll workers are paid um, and their training time is paid. Um, so once you factor that all in uh, and the amount of staffing, that's how I arrive at the higher number. Um, but I think the 5 million requested will cover most of those baseline costs. And um, Senator Austin, I see your hand up. I'm not sure if it's about. Um, wait, wait, hold it. I'll, I'll, I'll handle that. <laughs> okay. You, <laughs> you, you know, you can take the horse out of the. <laughs> no problem. Um, so I just I just have to tell me a question. Um, just to, you do have that bill in process to kind of minimize that so that that cost won't be realized. Yeah, we're, we're um, in the process of writing it, and we have communicated this to the GAE chairs. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Senator Austin. Thank you. Um, and uh, I wouldn't speak before Kevin Ryan was finished with his soliloquy. So <laughs> um, I do have a question on the new machines. Have the new machines been ordered? Uh, no, and by new machines, I assume you mean the tabulators that we were yeah. bonded for? 
No, not ordered yet. Um, they are, uh, we're in the process. So um, we have a review committee uh, and that process includes meetings, obviously, uh, and then uh, detailed inspections of the machine to make sure they meet security standards um, and some other steps. Once we finalize our decision, then we'll be able to uh, make a selection and undergo the contracting process. Do you plan on having these new machines in for the election? I would hope so, but it feels like we will not, mainly because the contracting process is outside of our hands. Um, and sometimes it takes a little longer to get a contract approved. Um, as soon as we can move forward, we will submit that contract and then it will depend on how fast it goes through the process, how many changes the AG's office might wish to make, et cetera. And um, if that is not the case, if the machines will not be here, do you have any idea how many um, uh, uh, towns will not have machines to use at all? Because we have heard from towns that said that their equipment is not capable of handling a single alder election. Um, yeah, I have heard the same, which is why I worked so hard to expedite this process. Um, which was delayed by the commission. But um, I just anecdotally, uh, as you know, we just had a special uh, election or a new primary in Bridgeport and at central counting, some ballots had to be fed through the machine 10 to 15 times before the little roller would take it to do a count. Um, I have not yet heard of any towns absent um, machines in totality, but should we not have the new machines, we'll definitely be reaching out to see if we can't um, redeploy some assets around the state to make sure, as you know, statutorily, every town needs a machine and a backup. Um, we also, depending on how long the contracting process takes, um, we do have in mind there might be a scenario where we can receive a small subset of machines prior to 2025 for deployment, um, if that will help. So if we could um, find out uh, before, uh, if, if there's any way that you could contact the towns to let us know now how many towns okay. are going to be in trouble. I don't think we should wait until we're not in session uh, to address the issue. So if we could um, get that information in the next week or so, finding out which towns by the same methodology, you had 123 towns yeah. respond to your survey. If we could um, have those towns uh, respond, that would be uh, great because I think this is something that we've all feared was gonna happen, that we were not gonna get it done in a timely fashion um, for a variety of reasons. And so I think that this is something that we need to be prepared to talk about. Absolutely, and you're reminding me, I did ask a question on the survey, how many towns had failed tabulators over the last several elections, but uh, we can definitely reach out and get this more detailed information and we'll get that to you as soon as we have it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Representative Paris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Secretary, good to see you. Uh, my apologies for my camera not being on when I when it turns on, uh, it lags. And so I don't want you to have to deal with that. Quick question, just uh, for my understanding in terms of the financial outlook from your uh, from your office. How often are we um, maintaining or or performing maintenance on the machines across the state? And what does that cost? Just at ter in terms of a projection. And additionally, the second part of my question is um, forecasting out, when do you foresee us having to make another major shift uh, in terms of machines over the next few years? How many cycles do you believe that we would have um, either in elect electoral cycles or in years? Thank you. Good, good question. And I, I think I thought you were going somewhere else first. I'm not as worried about 
the election infrastructure, the bonding for the new tabulators, um, are, uh, the new machines are expected to hold us for, you know, anywhere, you know, most companies guarantee 12 to 15 years, but you can usually eke out a life beyond that. Um, I'm actually more concerned about the costs that no one thinks about. Um, our agency had been flat funded for about a decade. Um, no expenses out there have been flat. Um, we received a modest increase uh, in this biennium budget, and we're thankful for that. But now we are being told that 750000 will be held back from our budget in this fiscal year. And if the same thing happens in the next fiscal year, that will be cataclysmic for the running of our elections and also our business services platform. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, in terms of annual maintenance representative to the tabulators, that is actually a cost that is handled by the towns. Um, after the original procurement um, that the state made um, in 2007, I believe, um, the towns pay for annual maintenance. Um, that is where, um, if any uh, issues come up, um, they try to fix those, um, find spare parts, et cetera. Um, and, and I apologize. Was there another part of your question I did not answer? No, Madam Secretary, that's that's perfectly fine. I guess just in closing, my concern is, and I, I say this so that we are thinking about this, that we're challenging, challenging ourselves to think about this. My concern is, is if we run into budget constraints in the future um, and the towns can't handle that cost, you know, the state will have to come in and, and take that on. And of course, I think that is important to ensure the legitimacy and sustainability of our elections. So I do appreciate that, but obviously something for us to think about as we're looking to construct the budget and um, ensure that our elections are fair and free in the future. Thank you so much for your work. No, thank you so much. And if I might just add to that comment, um, I think you're right. It's a delicate dance that we do um, between what the state should fund and what the town should fund. But um, we do need to ensure that every town across Connecticut can implement their elections in a safe and fair manner at the highest security standard. Um, so that is why I'm often very passionate <laughs> about some of these requests, because um, I think it is um, to our detriment of a democratic um, country if some of these costs go town to town. Thank you. Um, Rep uh, Representative Cholesky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good to see you, Secretary Thomas. Um, we recently saw each other in Danbury in person. That was very nice, so it's good to see you again. Um, going back to that five million, um, Representative Ryan um, you asked my question about how that was specifically derived, um, but is there a plan for distribution um, across towns for that, knowing you know that the needs of one town may be different from the next. And is there, you know, you know, relative to size, is there a plan for distribution? Representative, that is an excellent question. Um, as you know, the allocation for this fiscal year was uh, uniformly allocated across every town, um, and they all received the 10,500. And what I thought was interesting, there were some towns that said, we don't need that full amount. Can we give it back so it goes to a larger city who might who will need it? Um, but there was nothing in the legislation that allowed us to rejigger. Um, so uh, what I would say is I definitely would not be uniform across. Um, we have been talking internally about what makes the most sense. Um, uh, and it's not solely voter population. It may also come down to the number of locations. Um, so we are willing to work with uh, whatever committee would like to brainstorm about this a bit. Um, but I would like to earnestly say it cannot be evenly divided from town to town. Agreed. And thank you very much for that. And you actually... Um... 
uh, went into my next question, which was about that 10,500 for each town. Um, I believe that was 1.8 million in carry forward funds in the budget. Um, so has that not all been expended and can that then be applied for to fiscal year 25? It has been expended. Um, the last town received their payment a couple of weeks ago. We um, Some have reached out to us for guidance. Um, so we provided that saying that as long as it was used uh, for early voting purposes, uh, they could carry it over through the end of the um, calendar year. Great, thank you. I have a couple more questions. I don't know if we're sticking to the um, yeah, to the are. two question rule. Oh yes. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> have I expended my my two questions already? <laughs> come back, but um, uh, okay. representative, yeah, okay, and you All can right. come. Back. Okay. Thanks. All right. Great. Thanks, Representative Zawistowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I ran. Uh, thank you for being here today, um, uh, Mid Secretary. I guess this is the best means of address. Um, Anyway, I ran into one of my registrars at the post office yesterday, and she's been a registrar for a number of years. Um, she's been helping out registrars in some of the smaller towns, um, but there seems to be a lot of difficulty in understanding exactly what some of the rules are. Um, it, are, you, are you doing additional outreach to the registrars just to make sure everybody's on the same page? 100%. Um, just so you're aware, I host monthly calls for all registrars and then separately for all town clerks. Um, some of the rules have still been, you know, there have been a lot of, the bill gives an outline. We had to write actual processes um, and we ran into some legal questions. We sent the rules to every registrar in the state for their feedback in November, we received about 48 pages of comments. We went through each comment separately, updated the handbook. We've been having um, office hours. So we do virtual office hours. We've had three so far where we've had um, usually about 159 people or 160 on each call. Um, the new handbook. Uh, so after all of that, we put together um, a final handbook, which I am signing off on as um, soon as I get off this call, and then it is going to registrars. Um, we've also made some recordings with all of the commonly asked questions and have sent that to the registrars. Um, and now that the new handbook is going out uh, today, we'll be doing another round of office hours. Um, so our intention is to make sure everyone is ready for the implementation when it comes. Thank you for that. Um, I have also uh, another question. I have one of my towns only has 5,200 residents. And I know there's a lot of towns in the state, in the state that are, are, are considerably smaller. Um, the I the reg one of the registrars, and this is not the same registrar as I talked to yesterday. Uh, this is another registrar that um, went through a whole analysis um, to try, went with the 14 day early voting to find out roughly what the costs are. Uh, in some of the small towns, there's going to be problems with facilities. Um, some of the I know that a couple of towns are talking about renting trailers or, or, or whatever to be able to have something that's secure and not. Um, a school or, or it, it, it's it's creating it, it, there have to be some creative solutions to this. Um, the, the registrar that put together the um, the estimate um, this was right before the, the bill passed last year for a town of 5200 was about 90 about ninety five thousand um, dollars. And I, I think some of the small towns are going to have a really, really tough triumph time you know because they have small budgets to begin with. There's a fairly high impact. I was wondering if, um, as, as you're considering um, maybe helping out the towns, uh, if you could you know, possibly take into account um, just the overall size of the towns. Uh, and, and this is a, a fairly large burden for them. Um, so I'm, I'm just, uh, this is just a, not as much of a question, but just an ask. Yeah, absolutely. Thinking about how to deploy that funding is really important. Um, and I think you're underscoring what I said earlier, which is I don't think the five million covers the full cost of the implementation of early voting, but it will get the towns uh, most of the way there. And and I appreciate the consideration that, that any consideration you can give to our smaller towns. So um, so thank you, thank you for your answers, and thank you, Madam Chair.
Wait, you're muted, Madam Chair. <laughs> Representative Chalesky, you have a, a, a burning question? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, there was um, some enhanced voter access uh, funds uh, from ARPA in the budget. Has um, What does that mean specifically and can that be allocated to early voting? Uh, I'm gonna look at uh, Rachel Moser for, um, I don't have that figure in front of me. So the bulk of, this is Rachel Mosier, uh, the bulk of our ARPA funds is going to fund Connecticut VRA initiatives. Connecticut what? So as you guys know, the uh, Connecticut Voting Rights Act passed last year, uh, providing us with some new legislatively mandated responsibilities that began on January 1. Mm -hmm. um, and that funding is for uh, those positions. Okay. Hmm. And may I ask one more question, Madam sure. Chair? Um, the um, the Bridgeport election monitor that is now, that's being, or, or would be transferred to your agency. Um, what is the plan for that position? Is in, is there is there a thought of continuating that in perpetuity or, or addressing, um, uh, some issues in other towns, perhaps. Um, right. The legislature decides about the election monitor. Um, so that was granted uh, for the entire biennium. Um, as you probably know, we have had monitors in place in Bridgeport um, for the general election, the new primary, and for the new general that's happening in two weeks, uh, two weeks from today. Um, and then we will st uh, we'll ha need to hire a new monitor to take us from that election through November. Uh, so we do plan to have someone in place. Um, I definitely think it's still needed. Um, I would not go that route in perpetuity. Um, we have been brainstorming in our office about um, other ways to solve these types of um on the ground issues with elections, um, also solving them in cases where there's a gray area between what we think is acceptable and what it, in accordance with the law and rising to the level of a seek complaint, um, because there's a lot of mitigations that can be done in that gray area. Um, so be on the lookout for some legislation. <laughs> I thank see, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. There are still a lot of open questions um, uh, for your budget. I'm, I mean, tremendously. So I would expect um, as soon as you can start to map out these costs, it really would be good for us to get them and start to look them okay. over. Um, especially um, finding out about the new machines um, yep. that are being done the poll that you want to do to the towns um, and what you're asking, because maybe we have some things that we might need on that. Um, and then the, the, the who pays for the maintenance of those machines. I think those are the three things that I heard besides, um, you know, the, the personnel for the early voting. That's, that's another one. So um, the sooner, the better, and then we can have another work session because it's going to, this work session is going to take a little bit longer than, 30 minutes um because we're going to have to drill into this a lot more and and I know it's hard because this is like your second year and it's learning the system and it's hard it is a hard system to understand so um they, but you're talking to the right people I'm <laughs> up to the task I'm happy to provide as much detail as you are willing to stomach <laughs> oh we, we we need to because our voter registrars are on our call phones every day I mean, every day. So I, and I appreciate the fact that they're staying on top of us. So, so thank you. And I know um, we will be hearing from you soon and matter anything you get, please make sure you send them to Madam Administrator Susan so she can get it to, to everybody and we can, um, we can get to work on it. So this is very critical for all of us. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Have a good snow day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Okay, next we have Contract Standards Board. And let's see, I believe Greg is going to be our 
our next person. Thank you. Go right ahead, sir. Yes, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And, and good afternoon, members of the of, of the uh, of the Appropriations Committee. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, it's been an um, uh, interesting year, uh, having led the uh, the 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 um, this the staff now fully staffed. Um, but uh, if you haven't met me, my name's Greg Daniels. I'm the executive director for the State Contracting Standards Board. Uh, and with me is Jonathan Longman, our chief procurement officer, as well as Samson Anderson, our research analyst. Um, and today we come to you to talk a little bit about some of our accomplishments, as well as some of um, some of the challenges we're having um, now that we're fully staffed. First, I'd like to. I just want to give you. We have only thirty minutes, so. Okay, really quickly. Um, <laughs> really quickly. First, we'd like to thank you for all of your support. Um, we went from a staff of one. Now we're fully staffed. Staff of seven, and we owe all of that to um, most of that, really, to this committee. And so we're very, very thankful for all of the support you've given us, um, even prior to me joining um, the staff. Um, so we're very grateful of the, um, all of your support. Um, we also recognize that um, the governor's budget does not, uh, we does not reflect some of the um, operating expenses that we were hoping to um, address with the increase in staff. So those are some of the things that we wanted to kind of just touch on briefly um, in this discussion. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have regarding that, but wanted to kind of quickly touch on that. But we've done a fabulous job given the resources that we have. You can go right, you can go ahead and talk about your expenses. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> oh. okay, sure. Um, in fiscal year 23, because we didn't have, uh, we weren't fully staffed um, and I actually, the staff didn't come on board until the beginning of uh, uh, January 2023. We actually had um, lapsing funds of about $152,000. So um, that actually helped our um, uh, helped us in the end. And then ultimately we were able to unfortunately let a couple of staff members go um, early on um, after getting staffed, um, we were able to rehire, but that gap also helped us save a few dollars. Um, but unfortunately, um, now that we're fully staffed again, uh, fiscal year 25, we anticipate having a operating, um, a deficit in our operating expenses um, of approximately, I believe it should be about 30, is it 35, 30, $39,000, I believe. Um, and where we would like to somehow resolve that either by carrying over funds, which we anticipate we may have this year, or um, we did make a request through OPM to, um, to expand our budget and that was denied. Um, and, uh, ah. but yeah. <laughs> But um, but we do, we, you know, we understand that uh, the process and it's not personal um, and we're we're working through the process and we're hopeful that um, uh, that this committee will work with us to to rectify the problem. Greg, I'm going to ask a few questions. So how many staff members do you have right now? We have a total of seven. Seven staff. OK. And. Um, the the when you when you have a chance if you could give us a breakdown don't give it to us now but a breakdown of of how many people you have in the staff mm -hmm. uh, Representative Brian I'm just yeah hi I'm just looking did we get any kind of written testimony for this meeting I didn't see anything did I, did I just miss it no don't have any yeah okay, we, we don't yeah have any. we submitted we oh, submitted we oh okay so I didn't see it I don't know if it's gotten forwarded to us yet. Yeah, I didn't see it either. So, um, if you'd like to summarize what you put in your testimony, that would that would help, maybe. Oh, sure. What we did outline 
were some of the um, some of the successes, really. Um, first, with with our audit program, we were able to get our audit program up and going. We revised our audit program um, and really made it more robust with the um, with the uh, the with the um, addition of our accounts examiner as well as um, building um, working with now that we have staff working with our um, our audit and data analysis committee with the board. So we were able to revamp our complete um, audit plan uh, for the board. And, and now um, it's up and off and going and we've completed three audits. Um, they seem to be going well. We're getting great reception from the agencies from the feedback and that's actually dovetailing right into our training program, which um, we, over the past year, we purchased a, uh, a learning management system. And with that system, we've actually built modules. We're starting to build rollout of module. We did our first pilot program. Um, and now, which was our goal when we spoke with you last year. So we're at, we actually met that and we're actually in the process of um, actually starting to roll out our first course um, on ethics and procurement, which I'm, I'm very happy about. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, as, as things move forward, we're gonna, we're, we're, we're just all excited. I mean, given the resources in the year that we've had, um, we weren't expecting to um, still pull together and get accomplish as much as as we have. And so a lot of the findings from the audit program are finding their way right into our training program. And we're making um, much of the findings, they're, they're helping to prioritize what we're um, building into our training program. So into our modules, what we're finding to be important. Mm -hmm. Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to clarify the biggest part of the budget is personnel, but you're talking about some of the expenses not being there. How are the lack of those expenses going to impact the functioning of the seven staff and people that you have in the team? Sure. I, I, you touched on it, but can you go a little deeper? Yes. So when we first uh, initially, there was really one um, there was the former executive director, and there wasn't much for operating expenses. And so we were funded for staffing, but that funding for staffing um, didn't anticipate all of the ancillary um, costs that would come with staffing, like licensing for software, different um, just ancillary things that would come with that. And so um, if, if you needed a, a case management system, you would need licensing for each user. So it, it's just things that you, you kind of have to anticipate, but you wouldn't know what the cost of would be until you have the bodies in, 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 on the staff. So we're in a position where now that we know the number of people on the staff and then we're identifying exactly what the need is, we we know what the operating expense is. So it's sort of whether or not the carriage before the horse kind of situation. And so we're figuring that out um, as we as we go. Um, and we're trying to be prudent with what we ask for so that we're not over asking for money and, and having a, a huge surplus. And you suggested $150,000. That no, I said when we had a surplus of $150,000 due to um, the fact that staff weren't hired, um, you allocated the money and then the board went out to hire staff, um, but it took time to get the staff on board. So the money was sitting there, but by the time we came on board, it was halfway through the fiscal year. So... It was extra funds, essentially. You la It was lapsed. One hundred fifty thousand was lapsed, correct? Correct. It was lapsed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and uh, I just want to. And that was from fiscal year twenty three. Twenty. Twenty three. Uh, for the functioning, for the licensing, and everything, how much money are you looking for for the fully functioning of your department? 
we're, we, we were asking for, I believe it was uh, 30, I think it was 50. It's about $40,000. $40,000. $40, Thank you. Any other questions from the committee members? Yeah, I have one more question just to sure. clarify something. I mean, it, sure. I think Dr. Dr. Anwar just answered one of my questions. I got one of my questions answered. When you say you're doing audits and a, a course on ethics, um, I'm assuming you're filling in gaps that you don't see the auditors, state auditors doing or the state elections ethics commission doing. Uh, you're not you're not being redundant, but you're filling in sure. gaps. So under our statute, we're, we're required to work with the Office of State Ethics, the FOI Commission, um, the auditors of public accounts. So we're, we're required to work with them. So that's what we've been doing over the past year, collaborating with all of the agencies. So our our um, our ethics course was done in conjunction with the Office of State e Ethics. Thank you. So it, it, so it fills that, it really fills the gap, but it, it focuses on procurement. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you, Mr. Daniels, and um, thank you to your team. And um, if you could possibly lay out a budget for us that we could, um, I don't know if it was in your testimony, but if you could lay out a budget for us with the, the varying things that you talked about with the, the lapse was from this past year, correct? Yes. Okay, so the lapse, and then you said you had a 39,000 or $40,000 deficit um, and then just also identify the things that you have um, accomplished that that would be helpful to to us. Right. To us. Okay. Madam Absolutely. Administrator. Thank yes. You um, I, I owe everyone an apology. I was having technical difficulties with uh, my connection this morning. And the, apparently the general, the email that I had sent, I thought I sent to general government, a subcommittee and the, the folks leadership, um, never went out that had the oh. testimony. So I, I have found it um, and, and you now all have it. So Greg, my apologies. I thought I had it in there for them. So you have it all, you have it all now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Greg and your team. Welcome aboard, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good day. Um, I know we're early. Let's see. I I see Christine. Is Sarah anywhere? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. All right. Good. So we can roll right in on your testimony. Go right ahead, ma'am. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the committee. My name is Sarah Egan. I run the state's office of the child advocate. Um, and with me on Zoom is uh, associate child advocate, Christina Gio. Um, I hope everyone has, I think everyone should have our testimony, uh, which goes through the responsibilities of the office. How, no, you're shaking your head. Um, Rep, uh, uh, s s Madam Administrator, did we get that one? You just sent it out. We just got it in the last couple you of minutes. It just got the, the the whole all three agencies. Okay, so why don't you sum us up? <laughs> okay, so I wasn't going. I wasn't going to. Sorry, um, Sarah. No, no, was, no, 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 no. Please don't it, worry. I just it was a um, it was a bad technological look first hour of this morning. So thank you. No problem at all. I just want to make sure we give uh, the committee information that's helpful. So the testimony. So of course I have one screen. So I'm just going to sort of put it up and down, but. Um, the testimony outlines um, what our statutory responsibilities are. We are allotted eight FTEs. Um, we currently have seven filled. We have one vacancy that's already been posted and closed, and we're in the process of reviewing the candidates for that. Um, our testimony just, just walks through what everyone's responsible for. The general responsibilities of the office um, are actually very broad, which is to respond to citizen concerns, evaluate um, citizen concerns that raise a systemic concern about the provision of publicly funded services to vulnerable children, conduct a facility review and investigation, um, examine, oh my goodness gracious. I told you to walk in. I'm not a little bit, sweetie. Sorry about that. Um, sorry. 
sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Ay, ay, ay. Sorry, snow day. Um, <laughs> conduct uh, periodic reviews of facilities where children are placed by state agencies, uh, staff the state child fatality review panel, um, investigate the death, preventable death or near death of a child um, involved with a state agency, uh, pr produce an annual report about the activities of the Office of the Child Advocate, produce an annual report about child fatality review, produce investigative reports about child fatality as directed, um, and produce every two years a report on conditions of confinement for incarcerated or detained youth aged 15 to 22 uh, across the state. So those are our responsibilities. Uh, we work with um, our staff as well as uh, consultants to do that work. We recently received a grant in order to work with the some data folks in Connecticut to try to automate some of our data review for conditions of confinement. So that's new information for this year. Um, I am, I, as last year, uh, same as last year, I am asking for uh, two additional FTEs, children's services consultants, to assist with facility investigation and uh, fatality and systems review issues that arise from review of fatalities and critical incidents. Um, so that's, so we, the, our testimony walks through all of that work and then additional, any report that we've put out in the last year and, and then additional uh, ongoing work of the Office of Child Advocate. I'm happy to answer through that. I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Yep, everybody's on a snow day and if you have children, it's even more fun. Um, yeah. I just want to, I, I, I'm a little confused. So you are authorized for eight FTEs, but currently right. you have seven and you're yeah. asking for two additional. So Correct. are you asking for two additional on top of the eight or two additional on top of seven? Two additional on top of the eight. Okay. Two additional. Okay. All right. All right. Are there any questions? Senator Anwar, you look like you're reaching. <laughs> yeah. Senator Anwar, go right ahead. Thank you so much. And and as a recipient of uh, uh, the, the reports uh, from the Children's Committee and also Public Health Committee, you are doing some very important work. And, and I've had the opportunity to visit some of the facilities, the Department of Correction, and, and see some of our young uh, men in those cases to see how you're trying to do the best with the resources that you have. And, and also with the complexity of deaths through opioid, um, it's uh, miraculous how you're able to manage with the, the team of people that you have. And, and so I, I have seen firsthand their needs. So I, I, I personally have a bias in supporting that because uh, I know our children need to be protected. And, and there's uh, various agencies that are doing the work and your work is very critical. So it's just more of a comment, Madam Chair, but uh, wanted to say that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Representative McCarty. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I too would like to echo some of what Senator Anwar just said. I don't think there's anything more important than uh, procuring the safety of our children. And I noticed um, that there's been an increase some with our children in fentanyl uh, deaths. Would you would you just tell us, Sarah, with these two, you're you're looking for two more positions. Can you just explain a little more what those two would do and how that relates yeah. with the uh, fatality uh, report? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Representative McCarty. So um, so the state has a child fatality review panel that meets monthly with us. We provide staff support for that and the medical examiner uh, to review any death that comes under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner, children zero to 18. That's at least a hundred children a year um, from newborn to 17 that die in a manner that is preventable as deemed by the medical examiner. Those are going to be infants. That's the largest cohort of children that die for preventable reasons, about 20 a year um, through our teenagers who die by suicide, drug overdose, car accident, and homicide. Um, our job is to work with the panel to review patterns of risk that uh, contribute to child fatality and to work with the panel and partners around the state to develop strategies for prevention. As Senator Anwar and, and you mentioned, Representative McCarty, what is new 
uh, in child fatality really over the last five years are fentanyl intoxication deaths of children. Um, and they continue. So Connecticut remains firmly in the top 10 of all states for the rate of adult overdose per 100,000 individuals. Uh, we lose anywhere between 1,350 and 1,450 adults every year by overdose. And in many cases, um, there are children in that household as well, or a dependent child. Since 2021, we have seen over 40 fatalities or near fatalities of children under the age of five from suspected or documented fentanyl intoxication. We are about to release a report. Um, we're finishing a report now on the death of a 10-month-old um, about seven months ago from in intoxication from fentanyl and xylazine, right? <laughs> so these are really challenging issues. Um, and each of these deaths and near deaths has a host of public policy implications for everything from the state's Narcan distribution plan to the expenditures of the OSAC to the work of the Alcohol, Drug and Policy Council. We've made a number of recommendations, including to Senator Anwar and to the Public Health Committee around how do we wrap our arms around the uh, child safety? What are the best practices to insert, ensure child safety, prevent injury in the context of an adult-focused treatment model that rightly understands the concept of harm reduction? So there's implications for the work of a lot of agencies, public health, DEMAS, and the Department of Children and Families. We have identified through our fatality work that there is a lot of room for growth and for strengthening all of these practices. Um, we have reported and we'll continue to report that we have, I think at this point, um, a fair amount of concern around current practices that protect very young children um, in some of these situations. And our goal is to maintain families whenever possible. But to do that, we need to be doing things a little bit better than we are. Child fatality review and near fatality review is very labor intensive. It has to be done properly and responsibly. So we have people who do it, um, we just need more. And for every death um, that occurs, there are a host, as I said, of systems issues that we need to be able to understand fully. And our job, I think, is you know, legislature created this office to give you and the public and the policymakers an unvarnished view of what we think our most vulnerable children need. And we do that to the best of our ability, but there's more work that needs to be done. Uh, quickly, part two to your question, Representative McCarty, is you know, the OCA has two different statutory directives that require us to periodically review facilities where juveniles are placed by a state agency, language from memory, and two, report on conditions of confinement for youth age 15 to 22. Well, just taking the latter of those mandates, which was created in 2016 by the legislature, that's 500 plus individuals across a dozen plus facilities for which I have one FTE um, and who's terrific and amazing. And if she ever retires, I don't know what we'll do, but, um, but she's my age, so she's not going to soon. Um, and, uh, you know, and, but that also means that we're not going to um, some of these other places where most of them are. We, we go as much as we can, but just the, just the corrections review could take, you know, could keep six people busy, right? There's so much to do. And every time you walk into a facility and meet with a young person, you could be the only person who's met with them mm -hmm. in the entire time they've been there, you know, from outside that facility and they have needs that need to get addressed. So it's a never ending cascade of work. So I thought I'd ask for at least one, one more person to assist with that. Meanwhile, we got the grant, uh, Christina has been working on that to create, help create with some experts a data system that can help automate some of the work. But that's where the um, that's where the FTE requests would go. Thank you for the question. And, and if I may, thank you very much for that response, uh, Sarah. And I'm looking forward to reading your testimony. But if I may be permitted to say, I'd like to recognize your leadership that you have done with the interagency work and looking at best practices so that we can continue to move forward. So I just had to recognize you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions um, to Attorney Egan? Sarah, thank you. And as, as usual, I mean, everybody after listening to you, we, we want to just sort of put our arms around <laughs> 
OCA and just say, we're, we're, we're here, we're going to be there, we're going to figure it out. But you do a great job. And I mean, you also talk about the fact that, I mean, you didn't talk about the fact that you also provide soap and lotion and articles for the kids that, that are that are incarcerated, that don't have anybody doing that. And you manage to give them some sort of moment of joy and things like that. So for you and Christine and the whole team, you guys do a great job. Um, thank Thanks you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I just want to ask on the fentanyl deaths. I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm having um, conversations with members of on, on the OSEC um, committee and I'm 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 not hearing enough of it. I'm not hearing enough um, um, concern about it. We're we're more concerned about getting methadone and things out to people than I mean. We're looking at the same things, and and I don't know how to move that that ship a little bit. But I think we need to dramatically because um, we don't know who's doing a good job because we, you know, Connecticut doesn't like to do anything first. So we got to follow somebody. I mean, so if you have any, you know, ideas, please pass them um, to us because I'm, I'm desperately looking for, for somewhere to go to try and, and ignite the, the importance of us doing more stuff um, it, with, with this, with the amount of money that we've been given to try and, resolve or reduce the number of people that are going through an addiction problem here in Connecticut. It's, it's, it's horrifying. So I, I am, I'm begging anybody, if anybody has any, any ideas. Um, Senator Anwar, you had your hand up again. I, I did, uh, Madam uh, Chair, when you were mentioning, I just wanted to mention that uh, through public health committee, we were able to add in the OSAC, somebody representing the children's uh, um, issues and then we've had um, Office of Child Advocate be member of that group, but also for the ADPC, we feel that there should be a subcommittee focused on this aspect as well. So from through public health, we will try to see if we can improve that, that exactly is, what you're speaking to. Yes, I, 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 I didn't. When, when did we add the person, the member from from uh, Oka? Last session. I mean, we we proposed. Go ahead. Uh, yes, last you. So, Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, Go ahead. So you, so Senator Arwar, we, the OCA was added to ADPC. Yeah. We were, were not on the OSAC. The OSAC, yes. But, but public health did, I think there was language that, if I remember correctly, that added two individuals to OSAC who are knowledgeable about the impact of opioids on children, because that wasn't part of the original construction of the OSAC. I, I'll, I'll look for that mem those, those two memberships, because I haven't I, I, I'll look for those two memberships. So thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Christine. Thank you, OCA, for being there. Oh, Rep Curry. Rep Curry. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, quick question for Sarah. Um, so Christina met with the chairs of education last week with respect to a number of different items of concern. Um, one of which being the oversight of some of our special education outplacement facilities. And so right. I was curious to, to know whether your uh, position count uh, would be able to sustain uh, OCA taking on potential 10-4B complaints um, against some of these private uh, special ed providers. Well, that is an excellent question. Um, thank you for that. Um, so the, the review that, that you're referencing. So we do have a pending near conclusion investigation into services delivered to children by a state approved private uh, special education program, a large one in Connecticut that serves about 300 children a year, um, mostly black and brown children from poor communities. Um, we did that investigation jointly with Disability Rights Connecticut. And we do have a number of public policy recommendations that emerge from that. And Representative Curry, I appreciate your point that 10-4-B complaints are, are maybe a useful tool to get at certain issues um, with regard to our FTEs. Um, you know, the work that we're doing there is sort of on top of our other statutorily mandated activities and is complaint-based. I shouldn't say it that way. It's complaint-driven. 
which is part of our statutory mandated activities. So the resources are always a consideration in determining what remedies OCA can pursue, right? Legal remedies, um, legislative remedies, et cetera. So um, I don't have a definitive answer to your question, but taking on litigating a 104B complaint is resource intensive. Um, so it, it could only be done within the available appropriations that we have. If we have another couple hands for facility review and fatality review, um, it potentially frees up some resources to pursue other remedies on those other systemic concerns. Is that, is that? Yeah, yeah no, I think it gets to it. And, and I know we're living in a midterm adjustment world. And so I'm not look, yeah. sure we're not looking to increase uh, FTE counts at this point, but I think it's just important that we put this on the radar that we have uh, folks who are able to do this. We know these facilities exist. We know students are not being provided what they are uh, should have rights to. Uh, and so uh, I appreciate the work that you're doing and, and hope that we can continue that conversation. Thank, Thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, Madam Administrator. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you want what what's on tap for us next? At 3 30, we will be holding our public hearing. It's a Zoom webinar, so members should check. Although good news for the general government, A folks, it doesn't appear as though you've got anybody coming to testify. You're more than welcome to join us. Um, <laughs> but it appears as though the 44 speakers are all connected to judicial and corrections. Oh yay. <laughs> Uh, please, please join us. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody.